David Chalmers um, is University Professor of Philosophy and Neuroscience and co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness at New York University. He is the author of The Conscious Mind, The Character of Consciousness, and Constructing the World. He has given the John Locke Lectures and has been awarded the Gene Nickud Prize. He is known for formulating the hard problem of consciousness, which inspired Tom Stoppard's play The Hard Problem, and for the idea of the extended mind, which says that the tools that we use can become parts of our minds. Hello, David. How are you today? Oh, thanks. It's great to, uh, to be here. Pleasure to be talking with you. Your new book is titled uh, Reality Plus, published by W.W. W. Norton Publishing. And uh, first, I, I want to ask, uh, since you are by training a philosopher, what is it that caught your attention in regards to virtual reality? Virtual reality is wonderful for a, uh, for a philosopher because it's, these are artificial realities. Philosophers are really interested in the mind and reality and the relationship between them. But for reality, you might think, oh, we just have one to study. It's here, it's ordinary physical reality. But with virtual reality, we're making new realities, artificial realities. So suddenly we have a whole space of alternative realities to think about. Actually, it goes very deep in the philosophical tradition. You had in ancient Chinese philosophy, you had Drangzhi, who said, uh, how do I know that I'm Drangzhi, who just dreamt he's a butterfly? Maybe I'm a butterfly dreaming he's Drangzhi. How do I know that this is physical reality and not a dream reality? Um, you find in the modern, in the French tradition, Descartes in the, uh, in the 1640s said, how do I know that I'm not being fooled by an evil demon into thinking that all of this is real when none of it's real? Well, these days we ask that question by saying, how do I know I'm not in a virtual reality right, right. right now? How do I know I'm not in the matrix? Uh, yeah, could all this be a giant computer simulation? So this is kind of a modern way of asking some very traditional philosophical questions about reality. Right, right. Not to mention Plato's cave. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. Exactly. In the, uh, in the book I have a, uh, a mock-up of, uh, of Plato's cave for the, uh, for the 21st century. Plato's cave was, you know, maybe we could just be prisoners chained up looking at shadows on the, uh, on the cave wall. How do we know this is shadows on the, uh, how do we know this is reality and not just shadows on the cave wall. Well, in the, uh, in the book, we got marvelous illustrations of many of these scenarios. Mm. And here is, uh, here is Plato's cave. I don't know if it'll come through, but three people inside, strapped inside virtual reality down in the cave. And there's Mark Zuckerberg up top, <laughs> running, the, uh, running the metaverse, kind of as the jailer. Yeah. It's like a, um, a this is like a, the simulation argument's a kind of a digital version of Plato's um, analog argument. Um, yeah, yeah, cave, so exactly. Well, many people would say that virtual reality is like Plato's cave, it's mere shadows of reality. I'm actually a bit more positive right. about virtual reality than this. I think when we're in virtual reality, we're inside a real, genuine reality. It's just a digital reality. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, so, um, you know, the, the conceptual rigor that is ideally, right, the purview of philosophers, seems to be a much needed thing in understanding VR. Um, there, there, there's not a lot of um, sort of serious thinkers that are, that are thinking about VR. VR is pretty hot these days, but we don't have someone like you or, or, or others in, in the philosophical tradition trying to think about VR in any kind of serious way. Um, so, um, can VR... Um, we know that um, uh, philosophy can um, sort of contribute to uh, VR, sort of clarifying questions and, you know, this kind of thing. But can the converse be true? Um, can, can VR contribute to doing good philosophy? Does it have anything to contribute to philosophy? I think it can, actually, yeah. I think there's this two-way interaction in general between technology and philosophy that I like to call techno-philosophy. Mm. Just thinking philosophically about technology. So, yeah, the philosophy brings something to the technology. But I think the technology can also bring something to the philosophy. Like thinking about virtual reality, I think, can help us shed light on some of these very traditional puzzles about what is the nature of reality, what can we know about the, uh, the external world. And I should say I'm not the first person to, uh, to do this. There, there are a few people who have thought productively, philosophically about virtual reality. There was a Michael Heim back in the 1990s wrote a book on the metaphysics of VR. Philip Jai wrote a book called 
get real. But I think, yeah, there's so much philosophical potential from virtual reality that hasn't begun to be exhausted yet. The same goes true actually for artificial intelligence. Mm. AI has shed a lot of light on philosophical problems about the human mind. You know, how could the mind do these things? And then we see how AI does it. And that tells us something about the space of possible minds. Mm. In the same way, thinking about virtual reality helps us shed light on the space of possible realities. Um, and the fact that the technology now exists has turned some of these, you know, we always had philosophical fables about could this be a dream, could this be a shadow, could this be an evil demon, but now suddenly it's a live possibility. We've actually got virtual reality headsets that create these alternative realities. They're not yet indistinguishable from physical realities, but give it a few years, they probably will be. Then it's going to be a very live question. How do I know that this right now is not a VR? Because we'll be able to build that VR before long. Right, right. And, and also, not, not to mention, um, you know, uh, uh, now if, 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 with VR, we can walk into a thought experiment. We can construct a thought experiment in VR space yeah. and walk into it. Um, I'm not sure how useful that would be, but... Um, there are some philosophers who are doing this, actually, using VR to produce you know, lived-in, immersive versions of the classic thought experiments. So one is the trolley problem. Right. You know, you're heading down the track and you let it kill one person, or you let it kill five people, or do you divert it so it merely kills one person. They can actually put you into that uh, thought experiment, so somehow you have to make the choice. I think it probably takes a bit of work to get that passed on ethics committee. Right. I don't know if it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like it's one thing to consider these thought experiments abstractly and bloodlessly. It's another thing to actually be there right. inside the thought experiment. Interesting to see if people's decisions might go differently if they actually experience it from the inside in VR. Right, so maybe one day we'll be able to walk into um, uh, Mary's lab and, um, and, and, and become Mary. Mary in the, the black and white room who's studied color science has become a great scientist of the wavelengths of light and how they affect the brain and how they you get associations between different colors, but she has lived her whole life in a black and white room. She's never seen the color red. So yeah, maybe we're going to be able to put someone into, inside that black and white room and say, imagine you've lived your whole life that way. Can you know what the experience of a color might be? Maybe a really sophisticated VR. Maybe we can get a brain-computer interface so it'll actually then, the next moment, it will give you a new color Ooh, yeah. that you've never even seen before. It actually puts you into the thought experiment. Yeah. And then, oh my God. Could you have known what that would be like? Well, that's, that's fascinating. So um, this may require some oversimplification, um, but what would you like uh, your readers to get from reading Reality Plus? Uh, or perhaps we could rephrase that and ask, what did you set out to do when you wrote Reality Plus? I wanted the book to do a lot of things. I wanted to, to help people think about the technology that we're getting philosophically. You know, virtual reality is increasingly becoming part of our lives. Mark Zuckerberg is just going to announce the ambitions to pursue the metaverse. This is going to be part of our lives. So I want to think people to be able to think philosophically about that. I wanted to raise some grand speculative philosophical ideas and analysis of the nature of, of reality and get people to think about that, including ideas like could all this be a simulation? But I also wanted to introduce the problems of philosophy more broadly. The, the subtitle of the book is Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. So I kind of wanted this to be a book for readers who haven't necessarily thought about philosophy before, just to, or, or maybe some of them have. Nonetheless, I think you get a really distinctive light on the problems of philosophy through thinking about it through the lens of technology and of virtual reality and virtual worlds. Almost every issue in philosophy can raise in this context knowledge. How can we know that we're not in virtual reality right now? Reality, could all this be an illusion? Or questions about value. Could you live a meaningful, good life in a virtual world? Now, so what I tried to do in the book was uh, use these questions about virtual reality, raise them first because they're interesting, in their own right, but then second, I think they actually shed light on these very broad, traditional philosophical issues. If you can get clear on meaning, knowledge, 
reality, value, inside virtual reality. I think that's a major step towards you know, getting clear on that status in our lives more generally. I, I also think it's a, this is a great introduction for a, a general audience um, uh, to philosophy through VR. Um, we're, again, like you said, we're already moving, um, most of us are already moving in, in, into sort of VR space through Meta, so um, I, I think this is a great um, way to introduce uh, philosophy. Yeah, I've been kind of hoping that it's, it'll has that kind of that dual nature for me. You can put the focus on philosophy helping you think about the technology or on technology help you think about the philosophy. And I'm hoping that that ends up being of both philosophical interest but also a practical interest right. at the same time. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, you are, you're perhaps most famous outside of academia for coining the phrase the hard problem. Um, can you briefly define the hard problem? And how do you think your new book might contribute to understanding uh, this problem? Yeah, so in my day job, I guess, I'm a philosopher of the mind. I think about consciousness and the mind and its relationship to the brain. And, and here, you know, the big mystery of the mind, the central mystery of the mind is consciousness, subjective experience. And there's been a growing science of consciousness over the last 30, 40 years. But a lot of it tends to be addressed to what I call the easy problems of consciousness, which is questions tied to maybe behavior, how I respond to a stimulus out there, how I control myself when I'm awake compared to being asleep, how it is I can report certain things. Those are all like the objective aspects of the mind. Neuroscience and cognitive science are getting pretty good at explaining those things with stories about neural processes or computational mechanisms. By contrast, the hard problem is the question of how do all, does all this processing in the brain give you subjective experience? Why does it feel like something from the inside to be a conscious being? How do I have this subjective experience of perception, of feeling, of thinking, of acting? This is like the inner movie of the mind. And why does all that exist at all? Why aren't I just a zombie? who does all this without any subjective experience. So that's what I call the hard problem of consciousness. So it looks like all the things we're getting from neuroscience and AI and so on, although they're shedding a lot of light on those objective questions, the easy problems, on their own, they don't seem to tell you why it is that we have subjective experience at all. Right. It almost seems like magic. You know, exactly. You, you get all these sort of third person, this observable stuff going on and then first person experience, just the light goes on out of nowhere, it seems like magic. Yeah, and every, there's an old cartoon where they say, here's how it goes, process, 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 and then there's an arrow that says, and here a miracle occurs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> here's where the miracle occurs. Somehow we get from neurons firing in the brain to subjective experience, but that's the miracle we don't understand. Yeah. And the book touches on that, I'd say it, the focus is more on questions about physical reality, but three of the of the, of the chapters are about the mind and about consciousness. And one crucial question that comes up is, yeah, inside a virtual reality or inside a simulated universe, could there be conscious? Could there be consciousness? Could an AI system, maybe one that walked and talked and responded like a human being, would that be conscious? Or if we simulated your brain, would that have consciousness as you have? One view is it wouldn't have consciousness at all. I'm actually inclined to think that, yeah, virtual minds, our minds too. If you simulate consciousness, you will get you will get consciousness. But um, but that really goes to the heart of whether virtual reality is genuine reality. Because if it turns out that if you simulate the universe, you won't get consciousness, then people would say then that kind of virtual reality would be very much a second class reality. But you know, consciousness is what gives meaning to our reality. So figuring out the status of consciousness and virtual realities is really important to figuring out what roles we'll have in our lives. Um, there, was a great, um, there was a great movie on these themes actually last year, Free Guy. Free Guy? I don't know if you saw that one. Ryan Reynolds played a, uh, a non-player character oh, yeah, in, I a, remember in a video game and then yeah, he was just a, one of the random bank tellers or something but somehow he acquired consciousness. He was a conscious non-player character in a video game and then it's like okay well you know we have rights Rights too, Sims, equal rights for, uh, for, for Sims, for virtual creatures in a virtual 
simulation. There was a passage with, um, he was talking to his friend, and he said, does this mean none of this is real? And his friend says, I'm sitting here with my best friend, trying to help him get through a tough time. If that's not real, I don't know what is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great summary of kind of my attitude towards the reality of virtual reality. If we're in there, conscious beings, in relationships, communicating with each other, building community, and so on, then this is reality, and we're having a meaningful experience of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of there with you with um, this sort of um, uh, ontological parody, just to keep all these sort of different domains on par with each right. other. Physical um, reality and virtual reality, they're different from each other, right. but they're both equally real. Right, right. Um, so, uh, since you wrote a whole book on VR, it's safe to assume that you have some acquaintance with VR. Mm -hmm. um, are there any VR applications that you're most excited about at the moment? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, about every week or so, I get together with a group of philosophers from, uh, from around the world inside VR. And we, uh, we started doing this actually two years ago at the start of the pandemic, just as a way of keeping in touch and so on. But I've used that as a, as a way to uh, try out many different platforms and so on. And actually, quite a lot of the time we play, play video games. Um, Beat Saber is one favorite, you know, where you slice the, uh, slice the cubes coming towards you with a, with a lightsaber. You can get a bit of a, a small workout. So yeah, the games are, uh, the games are great. But um, in the long run, I'm the most interested in social platforms for VR, I mean, platforms where you can basically do the equivalent of what many of the things we do in physical lives, that is, you know, have real communities, people might work there, they might play there, they might entertain themselves there. Um, probably, it's interesting, the best example of this so far was not a full-scale virtual reality, this is Second Life, uh, which probably peaked about 15 years ago, but it's still going. You don't experience Second Life with a virtual reality headset. It's not fully immersive. You experience it on a typically on a two-dimensional computer screen. But people have built very rich social communities that way. Now people are trying to replicate this inside VR. So you actually experience it three-dimensionally from the inside. So Meta has introduced their virtual world, uh, Horizon Worlds. Although people are finding it, I think, a little bit antiseptic. Hmm. So well, far. they'll work on it. It'll, it'll it'll get better. I think. Yeah, they've got, they're putting a lot of money into it. Are there places that VR chat is maybe a much more freeform, crazy uh, community of all kinds of people with you know, crazy avatars and uh, people experimenting with, with identities and so on. That's actually been kind of exciting to see the way that people exp experiment different identities in VR, if it's a different gender identity or a different cultural identity. Or some people even like they get avatars that make them trees or you know, or, or non-human animals, and so on. That's a way of experimenting with uh, with identity. So yeah, I'm interested to see how these different social forms of life evolve in VR, and I think we're very much, just very much in the early days of that right now. I um, I like the image of um, a, a bunch of world-famous philosophers getting together on VR, and I wonder if um, perhaps with, like, you know, the the added um, um, feature of like changing neural neurons in the brain, if we can have a kind of virtual symposium, a la Plato, drinking involved, and you know, just sort of talking and all that. Yeah, well, even without the even without the fancy brain computer interfaces, we've we occasionally this group we have gotten together and we've talked about philosophy. For one time, I remember we tried to uh, we went inside one of these. VR platforms. I think it was one called Big Screen, and I gave a talk on the physics of VR inside Big Screen, and we and we started performing experiments. It turns out inside this thing you can throw tomatoes at each other, you can throw paper planes. So we started doing some physics experiments to try and figure out the laws of physics inside this uh, this VR. And I guess it was a kind of philosophical symposium on questions about VR. And we keep talking about having a conference in VR. The limiting factor for that right now has been you can only get so many avatars mm. in a single space mm. a lot of the time, but, but uh, you know, there, are, there are spaces which are getting better. Actually, Old Space VR, which is owned by Microsoft, is actually not bad for this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm hoping that sometime before long we'll have a conference on the philosophy of VR inside VR. Oh, that'll be really interesting. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, um, this might be a tall order, but um, 
perhaps something a philosopher can uniquely handle. Um, how do you define reality? And uh, what do you think VR, um, why do you think VR is just as real as the everyday world of physical objects? I, I think you, you, you've answered some of that already. How do I define VR was the first question. Well, how do you, how do you define um, real. Real. real? And, and um, uh, why do you think that uh, VR is just as real? Yeah, I mean, the word real probably doesn't have any single meaning in ordinary life or in philosophy, but I think there's a few different strands to something being being real. One is that something makes a difference in reality. It's got some causal powers. It can affect things. You know, my hands can, you know, can affect this book, and the book can affect me, so that's one strand of being real. Another aspect is that we say something is real. It's not just all in our mind. Maybe a dream is constructed by our mind. We want to be in contact with some reality outside us. And that's important too. And maybe the third is that reality not be an illusion. Something is real if it's roughly the way that it appears. Um, if it's, things are not the way they appear, then there's some element of unreality. I want to argue that VR, objects in VR can be real in all those ways. They're, they can affect us. Objects in a those lightsabers inside Beat Saber, they affect the cubes, they affect users and so on. They're, they're digital objects, but they have causal powers. They're out there independent of our minds. You know, VR can keep going even when there are, no, there are no users there to experience them. It's like the old thing when the tree falls in the forest and no one's around. Well, the VR can keep going when no one's around, so it can exist independently of our minds. And I want to argue it needn't be an illusion. When I go into VR and perceive a virtual world with it seems virtual to be, objects. It seems to be exactly what it, what it, what it seems to be. I think for a, for a sophisticated user of VR at least, you perceive this as virtual objects in a virtual world. You're talking to an avatar, there's another person there inhabiting this virtual world and there are virtual trees and virtual buildings, all that, all that is real. Maybe if you didn't know it was VR and you took it to be a physical reality, you could get an illusion. But uh, I think for the sophisticated user who knows it's all VR, I don't think there needs to be any illusion there. You're having real perception of a real digital reality. And you know, the, this reality is digital. It's grounded in, say, bits rather than atoms. But um, I don't think being made of bits is a way of being unreal. It's just a different way of being real. Right, right. Um, so, uh, do you have any books planned? And, and, uh can you tell us anything about them, if you're willing to? Oh dear, I just spent five years writing this one, so I was hoping I'd get another, uh, I'd get a year or two off writing any other book, uh, any other books. It would, uh, it takes it out of you. I mean, I'd be a lot of ideas for partly writing, maybe shorter pieces for now, maybe eventually a book uh, in the wake of, of this one. One kind of question which has come up a lot in thinking about this book and talking about it is some more practical, say, social and political questions mm. about VR. You know, the tech corporations, for example, are actually constructing these virtual realities. Well, this book kind of presents a somewhat idealized picture of VR as it could be in its very best form. But then the non-ideal questions come about the non-ideal theory of virtual reality, VR as it will be if it's actually constructed by the tech corporations and how we can make it better. And I'm I'm not an expert in these questions at all, but for some reason, suddenly a whole lot of people are asking me these uh, these questions because these are important questions for everybody, and even the corporations sometimes. And um, you know, they say, "Could you come and talk to us about these things?" So I'm having to think hard about some of these social and um, political questions about what kind of form should the virtual realities that we build take? Are there alternatives to, for example, corporate-owned and governed virtual realities? Are they user-owned? and govern virtual realities. This actually, I think, intersects with a lot of deep philosophical questions I didn't quite touch on in the book. Questions about free will. How can we live autonomous lives in VR, which are not manipulated, say, by the, the corporate owners of that VR. Questions about identity. How can we you know, express our identity inside virtual reality? Uh, questions about yeah, privacy and uh, what is the you know the domain of the self and the domain of the uh, of the of the society? So yeah, that's probably I don't know if that's a book. Perhaps it could end up being a book. I don't know. One of these days, I'll also try and come back, 
I always come back to con questions about consciousness because that's what I started with. That's what I'll end with. Um, one of these days, maybe I'll try and write a definitive book on where things stand or the, the problem of consciousness. But yeah, I'm taking a little break for now. Okay. okay. You might might take a, a, a VR vacation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> VR vacations are all right for now. I don't know yeah. that I'd... Uh, right now when I go into VR, I don't usually want to spend more than, say, an hour or two there. Mm -hmm. Once it gets really good, on the other hand, yeah, go to go to the beach in VR, it'll be just as good as going to, uh, going to the beach in physical reality. I suspect we're not going to be in that point for another decade or two yet, but yeah, when that moment comes, I'm there. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, holding up your book, uh, could you give us an unabashed pitch for your book, Reality Plus, and why we should read it? An unabashed pitch for Reality Plus? Well, this book is just the bee's knees. Uh, <laughs> um, I think if, I think, for me, it's a way of thinking really hard about the technology, which is going to be part of our lives, but also doing this, it's also a way of thinking hard about very big issues about reality. And I think everyone has like a natural philosopher within them. We want to think about uh, ourselves, the nature of ourselves and our consciousness, the nature of reality, how can we lead a good life? These are the big questions of philosophy. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to know how to approach them. I think this lens of thinking about technology, virtual reality in particular, but other technologies too, the internet, smartphone, smartphones, artificial intelligence, this gives us kind of a new and productive way to focus on those age-old questions. So I'd say, yeah, read this book if you're interested in philosophy. Read this book if you're interested in technology. Read this book if you're interested in science fiction. There are so many different science fiction angles uh, in this book, whether it's The Matrix or Black Mirror or Sword Arts Online or uh, well, every, now, every day there's a new, a new science fiction series coming along. I've just been watching Severance okay. on Apple, Apple TV+. Plus. I guess the next edition of the book is going to have to incorporate all the, uh, all the new science fiction. But uh, yeah, I think... I'd like to think there's something in this book for, for everyone. And I, I, think they, I think there will be, um, especially for um, anime fans. Um, uh, consider, for example, Ghost in a Shell. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, just, just name like, you know, uh, close your eyes and spin around and you'll land on an, on an anime that's interested in VR. Um, and interested in a way that, that's sort of philosophically interesting. One central concept in the book is well the idea of immersion in VR and then like the ideal for there's experiencing the VR all around you and the ideal of immersion is what's sometimes called full immersion or actually but what we're called in this was introduced in Sword Arts Online as full dive VR You're, to be fully immersed in VR is to fully dive into VR with no trace left of the outside physical world we're not yet at the point where we have full dive VR, but Sword Arts Online does such a, a magnificent job of uh, illustrating uh, full immersion as well as, and their term, full dive VR, which comes from, which uh, comes from Sword Arts Online, has now been adopted by the, uh, by the industry too. So that's a place of like direct contribution from this form of, of science fiction to this, uh, to thinking about philosophy. Would, would, you, would you like to, to read a passage from your book? Sure, why not? What do I do, start at the beginning? Okay, how about this? The central thesis of this book is virtual reality is genuine reality. Or at least virtual realities are genuine realities. Virtual worlds need not be second class realities. They can be first class realities. We can break down this thesis into three parts. Virtual worlds are not illusions or fictions. Or at least they need not be. What happens in VR really happens. The objects we interact with in VR are real. Second thesis. Life in virtual worlds can be as good in principle as life outside virtual worlds. You can lead a fully meaningful life in a virtual world. Third, the world we're living in right now could be a virtual world. I'm not saying it is, but it's a possibility we can't rule out. This thesis, especially the first two parts, has practical consequences 
for the role of VR technology in our lives. In principle, VR can be much more than escapism. It could be a full-blooded environment for living a genuine life. I'm not saying that virtual worlds will be some sort of utopia. Like the internet, VR technology will almost certainly lead to awful things as well as wonderful things. It's certain to be abused. Physical reality is abused too. Like physical reality, virtual reality has room for the full range of the human condition. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The title of this book captures my main claims, Reality Plus. You can understand it in a number of ways. Each world is a new reality, Reality Plus. Augmented reality involves additions to reality, reality plus. Some virtual worlds are as good or better than ordinary reality, reality plus. If we're in a simulation, there's more to reality than we thought, reality plus. There will be a smorgasbord of multiple realities, reality plus. I know that what I'm saying is counterintuitive to many people. Perhaps you think that VR is reality minus. On this view, virtual worlds are fake realities, not genuine realities. No virtual world is as good as ordinary reality. Over the course of this book, I'll try to convince you that reality plus is closer to the truth.